Hello, everybody, and welcome to Debate Hub. I'm so excited to be here. Everybody has made it. Somebody's running in at the very last second, but I'm not gonna say who, because I'm a super nice guy, and we're not gonna tattle on people in here. Uh, for anybody who has... <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who's new here, I am Chesh. Welcome to Debate Hub. I've got with me Dapper and Jackson, who have both been here before. I'm very excited to introduce you to Daniel. Today we are going to be talking about creationism and evolution, and we're going to be talking about kind of like maybe vaguely scientism, but we're going to be getting a little bit more into that much later in May. So make sure to like and subscribe. There's going to be tons of content coming out here recently and upcoming and coming for the next couple of months. So, rules of engagement. We're going to let Daniel go first and have the honors to introduce himself, tell us kind of a little bit about who he is, what he does, and what his position is. Then we're going to let Dapper and Jackson kind of ping pong back and forth between each other, as that is how they are wanting to do, about what they, um, what their position is. And then they're going to just kind of open the floor to a discussion. We're going to try and be as respectful as possible. There is a little bit of delay in vMix, so if people are over-talking, I will... Try not to step in as little as possible, but if necessary, just to let somebody finish a point or get like a little thing across. Otherwise, you're not going to hear too, too much from me. Welcome everybody to Debate Hub, and I hope everybody has a lovely, lovely time. Daniel, would you like to take it away? Sure, sure. Got involved with this because I, I trolled a comment on the evolution. Somebody was discussing evolution, and I said... I'm not aware of any, uh, science isn't aware of any type of uh, uh, mechanism where genetically there's huge transfers of information to, to create a new kind of animal. And that's where it got started. Nobody answered me on that, by the way. Uh, but anyways, my background is that I'm, I'm a general contractor in Arizona. I've been a Christian for 42 years. The first 10 years, I didn't care about this stuff at all. Uh, it didn't matter to me, evolution, none of that. Uh, I was watching TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, way back in like 1992. And Hugh Ross was on there, who's an astrophysicist. He's a theistic evolutionist. And he went through Genesis and said, this actually means this. And he was putting it with the ages of evolutionists. In the, in the, and I was, I was so excited. And I knew better to, to go repeating that stuff without checking the Hebrew first myself. And my brother called me and I, I blurted it out to him and he said, Danny, and he was very antagon antagonistic, big evolutionist back then, said either either go with science or go with, Bi go with the Bible, but don't try and mix the two and make it sound acceptable. So I thought about it, I said, you know what, you're right, I'll get back to you in 10 years. And at that point I began to study the really just the broad, the whole broad thing. Spent about three hours a week for ten years, just looking at all the information. And, all, and what that really did was was give me a, a basis through which I can look at the raw data myself and make come to my own conclusions. I don't have to have somebody tell me what it all means. Somebody with a political or monetary agenda tell me what that stuff means. Uh, and then I spent another ten years debating it with a lot of scientists online, but. This is different because I can't sit there and, and uh, you know, take 30 minutes and read something they posted and the papers on it and give them an answer. This is so anyways, that's where that's where you were debating. It I text. come from. So. Yes. Over over usually discussion boards back then. This is before ah. social media with social media. Yes. The classics, the classics uh -huh. dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing and, with us, and thank you so much for coming on, because a lot of the times we try to have these kinds of discussions, a lot of times we'll get, like, one side or the other just refusing to actually engage in the conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Dapper Jackson, you two uh, want to take it away? Did you guys flip a coin? <laughs> do we want to just get into it? Because there was stuff we, right at well, the beginning. Well, we'll do a little bit it. of an intro. I'll, I'll, I'll do, do a little, little bit of an intro if you don't have much more. Right, Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Dinosaur. You probably know me from my channel or this channel, or most likely both. There's a lot of overlap there. You probably know Jackson from his channel or my channel or this channel or all three. I don't know. Uh, Jackson does good stuff. Go subscribe to Jackson Wheat. Um, so we are, uh, we, we form sort of a, a dynamic duo when it comes to having conversations with young earth creationists, Jackson and I. And we've had numerous, and I would say overall mostly very successful in the sense that, um, dialogues in the sense that I think both we and the creationists in question thought that we had a good conversation. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone learned things. 
And while we might not have been able to reach agreement with every creationist that we've talked to, I think overall we've always come away. Well, not, okay, maybe not with Rob, that Rob Groen guy, maybe not him. With everyone else, though, I think we've managed to come away uh, appreciating where they were coming from, they, they better appreciating where we we're coming from, and having food for thought. Um, my position on this whole thing, as well as Jackson, is going to be solidly in line with uh, the current consensus in science. Now, <clears throat> being the current consensus in science does not make a position correct. Uh, it doesn't not being the consensus in science doesn't make a position incorrect. However, what it does mean is that basically all of the experts in the relevant field have said on the basis of their often lifelong study that this particular interpretation is the one that best fits the evidence right now and therefore should have provisional assent. So I'm not going to argue that there's no God. I'm not going to argue that I know how life first started on Earth. I don't. I'm not going to argue that there's no creator. I don't have a way to establish that scientifically one way or the other. However, I will say that I do think that uh, Jackson and I have some things that we can talk about when it comes to things like kinds, whether that's a meaningful term in the first place, uh, whether things can change from one kind to another, if we can find a definition for kind that's actually something that is not just verifiable, but also falsifiable, importantly. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting into those topics because I think that uh, both Daniel and uh, we two here will have some interesting points to talk about when it comes to things like kinds and whether things can go between kinds or whether that's even a question that is a meaningful question to ask, because that is another thing that often comes up. Is it, is it actually meaningful to say whether or not organisms are divi divisible into kinds and whether they can cross between them? So yeah, uh, that's all I have. All right, perfect. I think that's a pretty good intro. I think everybody kind of understands where everybody else is coming from, right? Does anybody have any like solid questions right out of the gate for uh, the purpose of clarification? I mean, my big one is what is a kind? Because I hear the term a lot. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. I don't always hear the same definition used between creationists, which is fine, right? Not everyone has to have the same stipulated definition. But most of the time when I do hear a definition, it's one that doesn't seem like it's actually useful in terms of the discussion. So I think the first order of business really should be to try to figure out what do you mean, Danny, when you say kind and how could we tell if a change between kinds had occurred? What evidence would be well, that, necessary to see to make that determination, basically? Sorry, go ahead. Well, however anybody else, oops, sorry. However, however anybody else uses that term, like answers in Genesis, I don't care. I use it just in a simple term, dog to cat. Mm -hmm lizard to amphibian to lizard those 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 are different kinds of animals uh tiger right, well, that... versus uh bear different kinds of animals well, or concerns or me a little bit because oh sorry why well i'm just well, trying so to make I, a little bit because, because... sorry there's, a, there's a bit of a delay in vmix uh danny if you want to finish what you're saying then dapper go ahead yeah oh, that's okay go ahead uh, so that concerns me a little bit and i think jackson might share this concern because when you say categories as different as uh say cat versus frog there is oh, about as much dog. diversity in frog <laughs> that yeah dog or cat or dog so dog say versus frog right there's about as much <laughs> diversity in terms of genetics morphology behavior in frogs as there is basically in like all of mammalia so like two frogs might be as different from each other as say a human is from a kangaroo and so I feel like if you're willing to put frogs into a possible kind, but then willing to separate out, say, bears from cats, I, I don't know that you have a definition that could hold up to much questioning. It seems like it's just sort of a, I know it when I see it. And maybe Jackson has something else that he has besides that. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let Jackson take the next one. Oh, Jackson, I don't think we can hear you. I think you're muted. No, I just heard him. Oh, did you? Now you're mm -hmm. muted. Yeah, I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Yeah, I can't hear him. Are you muted on your microphone? Ah. Jackson, this is a sign well, from the divine let, that you were wrong about evolution. <laughs> yeah, let's let, let's start with something a little little more uh, where you can where that you would consider something debatable along the lines you're talking about. The particular animal, you probably know what the name of it is, I don't, but on a lot of uh, 
the new evolutionary trees, there's there's an animal that they said was the ancestor of both cats okay. and dogs. I mean, I don't know of any animal that is claimed to be the ancestor. I do know that the myosids are, well, myosids is a weird term, but that animals like myosis are um, morphologically intermediate between caniform and feliform carnivorans, so, but, and that that but also, like, group with is probably guys, ancestral. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, like, that's an ancestral group. Like, it's not like they are, like, sitting between the extreme of, like, cat on one side and dog on the other. They're like, you got cats and dogs up here, and then you've got, like, down here, you've got, like, the meocids, right? So they're ancestral. They have characters that are plesiomorphic or ancestral to both of these groups. We can't run right. straight to plesiomorphic, Jackson. We have not said That's why I said ancestral. Yeah, I was going to say, what's, okay. what does that mean? <laughs> okay. All right, fair enough. Ancestral, yeah. Plesiomorphic Out with the jargon. Ancestral. Well, then I would, um, so, but my, my claim is still that they don't have that animal that it, you find as a fossil uh, does not have the, there's no genetic mechanism within them to eventually, uh, what's the word, evolve into uh, cats and dogs. Why not? Well, what characteristics yeah, what is, would, do you think like that? Because you, because you don't see that now. You, do, you don't mean? see science. Well, science doesn't see a mechanism. For those large uh, additions or transfers of information in the in the genetic in the genetics so of these animals, of any animals. that was actually going to be my question was when you say information because that was one of the things you said early on. And I do apologize because you were referring to my um, my tweet uh, that was my tweet at the beginning. And when a bunch of people start jumping on my tweets, I just mute oh, them. So yeah. I apologize for not uh, getting to you on that one. Um, but my my response to that would have been to to your tweet and your point here is when you say information i think information just like kind doesn't really mean anything uh but i'm happy to hear your definition uh what what do you what do you personally mean when you say it well it does mean something i mean just just for instance between chimpanzees and humans how many how many pieces are in difference in in the information people say they're so close but that there's like three million different there's three million pieces of information difference in the genetic code between both both animals, out of like six see, billion, I yeah, I mean that's a that's a so, three, yeah. that's a very small fraction. But hold on, I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. So, Daniel, are you saying that everything in the genome, every single base pair, is itself information, and that any change or addition to the genetic code would in fact be additional information, or at least a change in the information? Well, there's 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 enough information in there to adapt to their environment. That's that's what I read. But there's not okay, enough but that doesn't really answer the question. Because I want to know what you mean when you say information. And when you say that there's about 3 million differences in the information between chimpanzees and humans, I happen to know that that's about the number of base pair differences in the alignable coding regions between pantroglodytes, the chimpanzee, and homo sapiens, the human, which says to me mm -hmm. that what you mean by information is simply the sequence of the genetic code. And so that whenever that changes, yeah. that means that the information has changes. Would, would you agree mm -hmm. to that definition? Okay. I, I guess. So I just wanted to make I sure guess. that I knew. I mean, I'm not sure. It's not a trick question. I'm just, that's what I'm hearing. And I just want to make sure that if that's mm -hmm. not what you mean, that we have a chance to figure yeah. out what you are trying to say. And that, if that's what you mean, great. But then I would just say mm -hmm. every mutation adds new information right. to a genome. Yeah, you have mutations that your parents don't have, that their parents didn't have, et cetera, that your you know brother didn't or doesn't have, or your cousins, whoever. So every single person has a unique, uh, you know, uh, geno uh, genome. You are going to have everyone's going to have mutations that are not shared by anyone else, right? If I can just jump in with a clarifying question, so that that's how we get like uh, DNA evidence in in like forensics, right? Well, sure. So like with forensics, DNA. one of the things you're looking at or paternity tests, you're looking for things that are like, um, oh, shoot, I'm so mad at myself. Uh, they're like they're repeats. So you have like these little um, like uh, uh, like duplicated repeats and everyone has a very specific like arrangement of them. And that's how you can compare like, you know, a, a presumptive father with the you know presumptive child or whatever and and say, well, is this or is this not the the father, uh, you, you base it on those like highly variable regions because 
it's extraordinarily unlikely that any two people are going to share these highly variable regions. But but the point I'm trying to make with this is since everyone has a very ever so slightly different, you know, set of mutations in their genome and what what Dapper just said up there uh, was that <laughs> the differences between humans and chimps are these three million base pairs, which I believe you said did count as information, right? These This is the information difference. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is information difference among all of us, right? And some people are going to have ever so slightly longer genomes than other people. Some people are going to have slightly shorter genomes because in uh, insertions and deletions can add variable amounts of nucleotides. So wouldn't like an insertion count as additional information? So you have an, an additive... Uh, effect yeah, there? through breeding, mm -hmm. through breeding. Uh -huh. But these okay, these the, animals why? are not breeding together. Yeah, you're you're talking massive amounts of information between, you know, a tiger and a and a bear, and right. uh, and there that sort doesn't of. that if, if you're going to have that kind of information exchange, it's got to be through breeding, and they don't breed. Uh, so, so hold on, what, I, I'm confused. Okay. Do you mean that okay. bears aren't breeding with tigers? Or do you mean that bears aren't right. breeding amongst it? Okay. So I, no, bears aren't breeding with tigers. <laughs> right. so try, the, the model, <laughs> the model that I'm, um, well, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask a tiger what it's doing with that bear, but I, I suspect you're right. That sounds no, really breeding. risky <laughs> yeah, for everybody I'm, involved. I'm going to leave that tiger and that bear to do whatever they want, but I'm assuming that you're right here and that they're probably not breeding. Um, even if they tried, I suspect it would not be successful in the sense of having offspring. But the, the model that is proposed by evolutionary biology is not that tigers and bears breed together and that that explains the differences in the genetic code between them. The idea is that within a population <clears throat> that is breeding, new genetic var uh, variation will arise from mutation. And that over time, this population may in fact split into different groups that are not anymore breeding together. And then when that happens, what that means is now the mutations in one group are not shared by the other group. And so they start to diverge. So when you have a group that is breeding together, it tends to even out some of that diversity so that it gets shared around the entire population. But when you have two groups that aren't breeding together, when one mutation arises in one group, it doesn't necessarily arise in the other one. And so you start to get more and more differences between those groups rather than within one group. And then as this happens, those two groups may become different because all, I mean, ultimately what's the difference between a, a tiger and a bear? It comes down to the genetics, right? If you had a bear embryo or not embryo, a zygote, right? And you just completely replace its DNA with a tiger genome. I mean, you'd probably get a tiger out of that embryo if you could bring it to full term. So that's really what the big difference is, right? Is the genome. And so the evolutionary model is just saying that as these genomes taking the whole population into account diverge now that they're no longer breeding, they become more and more different. And so when you look at, say, the common ancestor or something that represents the anatomy that would be expected of the common ancestor of bears and tigers, which would be something like Miasis or the other similar animals that we know of from uh, that time frame, <clears throat> you can see that basically what happens to get you to, uh, say, tigers is that you get a population that finds things like uh, particular kinds of scent marking more important, uh, particular ear structures evolve that don't even seem to really matter that much in terms of actual auditory like acuity they're just different that is a thing that's characteristic of cats uh you get the evolution of somewhat more uh flexible shoulder joints whereas on the bear side oh and also in cat side you also get the going up onto the tippy toes rather than walking on the heel and the uh the um you know like the flat of your palm like bears do and on the bear side you start you know um selecting for things like a stockier build um a more generalized diet instead of the hyper carnivore diet that cats were selected for a shorter tail. But ultimately, none of those are things that are unknown today, because you know, most creationists now will say things like, well, foxes and wolves probably share a common ancestor. Well, okay, but they're very different morphologically. And if we were to project the current differences between wolves and foxes out a few tens of millions of years, I would suspect that they would become as different then as, say, cats and bears are today. And so I think by objecting that we don't see breeding between bears, say, and tigers is to misunderstand the model itself. And I'll shut up now. Well, Thank you for coming to his TED Talk. 
Yeah, I'll go back to Wheaton. Uh, first off, why are you calling those? Why are you calling the differences, for instance, of, of a one human from the next uh, uh, offspring um, due to breed due to mutation? Why are you calling that well, due to mutation? In other words, well, if, I, if we have a kid, okay, yeah, what, the the child totally looks different. Why are you saying that's due to mutation? Well, well differences difference in your appearance can be, yeah, it can be environmental and it can be genetic. That's it, your appearance is kind of a mix of both. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, so one thing is, so by definition, a mutation is a change that arises when a genome replicates and it is not inherited from ancestral genomes. So, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you said that you 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 have a son, so we we know that when you had your son. Half of your genome went into the spermatozoan that went to, you know, go on and create your son. But when that divided to create that sperm cell, there were mutations that occurred. There are variations in the genome that your son inherited that are not anywhere in your genome. And those are, by definition, what a mutation is. So when we say a mutation, that's what we mean. It's an aspect of the, gen of the genome that was not present in the ancestor of that genome which is one half of your genome is in fact the ancestor of one half of your son's genome. And so, I mean, when you say, why would we call that a mutation? I mean, that's just what mutations are, right? It's like, why do you call that fluffy white thing in the sky a cloud? It's just, that's what clouds are. They're the fluffy white things that are in the sky. I, I don't know. I've never heard anybody define a mutation that way. I mean, I mean that's just the definition of, of mutation. I, yeah, my understanding that. is that that's, Oh, I mean, that's fair. What was your, what would be your understanding of what a mutation is? Because maybe that's part of the confusion. Is maybe we're just speaking a mutation, different A mutation is damaged information or. Yeah, no one uses instance, it. That I way. saw you, I saw you wrote a, I saw you wrote an article on a, or had an article on a, the blind fish in the caves. Mm -hmm. And I've always certain, I've never read anything about that. Maybe nobody's done this. My idea would be with those would be to capture some of those. Uh, and bring them back mm -hmm. into the light and see if see if th that is a genuine mutation to see over it generations. Is. If you know that, that is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Let them finish. If that so it's already been done. Itself. Because no, it's already done been done. done. Yes. So yeah, I actually did a video. So, um, I was on somebody else's channel, uh, this guy named mm -hmm. Aaron Raw, and he had me watch a video by this guy named uh, Big Wave Dave, where he talked about uh, oh, yeah, uh, Big continuous Wave environmental Dave. tracking. Uh, and he was like, mm -hmm. oh, yes. Uh, according to this technical paper, it says if you take the fish, if you take the blind cave fish, the Astinax mexicanus from the, the, the caves, uh, and you raise them in light, ah, oh, their eyes just regrow. Well, if you actually go read the paper, which I did, because I was like, that doesn't sound right. It says like literally the exact opposite. So what happens is yeah. basically while they're while the fish is developing, and I think we mentioned I think we mentioned this in the video, but I, it's been a little while. I don't quite remember. Um, so while they start developing, there's basically a mutation or there's a, yeah, the, there's a mutation in the eye development program, program, whatever you want to call it, the set of genes that are involved in building the eye and all those structures. And it basically caps um, the development. So it kind of just kneecaps the development and the eye never forms. Um, what's really cool though, is you can, um, is because the cave fish don't have eyes anymore, you know, or, in, in any real sense, um, they've heightened their other senses. So their lateral line system is like super huge and it covers way more of their body than it does on most fish. Uh, they have taste the way, buds I'll, outside I'll, of their mouths. Quick. Sorry, go ahead. I just want to point out a lateral line system because not everyone knows is actually a, a system of like sensory pores that fish have on their bodies. And that's used mostly to detect things like changes in uh, water pressure that yes. helps them detect things like passing waves or something. It basically, if, they can help tell what's moving out there by using this lateral line system. Just so we know. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, sorry, the, the I, if you ever need me to, if you ever need me, to, well, you're not dumb. But also, <laughs> if you ever need me to clarify, me. I, I do apologize. Um, I'm very used to just going straight to jargon. So if you ever need me to, like, if you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on, define that word. I'll happily do that. Well, just, um, just so you know, I have, I've always figured that 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 they have developed much uh much broader and more sensitive of the other thing just like mm -hmm. blind people do they can yeah, hear exactly. better, so actually, you know it's, it's, it's something something that happens over time but uh but I, I i'm thinking well has anybody tried this first off that's a lot of generations to see see if the cell cells start to repair themselves within those fish 
and they start to develop eyes over over quite a few generations, mm -hmm. like the like the fruit fly experiment, the the great whatever so I, that was back uh, in the fifties, the guy with well, the fruit flies a thing. in a bottle. Well, well, well they, they developed the mutation. They developed the, the mutation, that, and when they stopped the experiment, they went back. Well, th that's not what. Um, well, okay, so basically, what happens with well, with that was the 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 intention for the fruit fly experiment, which was actually like the the nineteen teens. That was a uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan's mm -hmm. work, um, but th that was more just to figure out like what genes are involved in eye development. Uh, that was like the homi homeobox mm -hmm. uh, or the homeotic, sorry, not homeobox yet. Uh, the homeotic research. Basically, they weren't trying to figure out if these flies could survive in the wild. They were just trying to figure out well, what genes are. I don't even know if gene is the right word. What traits? What genetic traits mm -hmm. uh, are are heritable traits? Are <laughs> we have all these nice words now that we can use to like define things that they didn't have back then it makes it so much more yeah, this uh, efficient is, this is around the time oh. when the word gene was coined to refer to indivisible right. like heritable characters that mendel was dealing with and it later on went to right. be like well now we're going to talk about it in terms of like this set of dna that helps code for a protein but yeah um, um so i actually have a question i'm okay. curious about okay. if if the cavefish were to redevelop eyes would you see that as Confirmation or disconfirmation for the theory of evolution? Uh, confirmation for the, for um, variation due to environment, but not to change from one kind of animal to another. Okay. Well, then micro, I guess we're, micro we're evolution to... versus micro versus macro evolution. Uh, I, I don't like those terms, but that type of I thing. I also don't like those terms. I agree with you. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan <laughs> of them either. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think they're terribly useful. They were coined by someone who was quite wrong about evolution to explain a difference mm -hmm. that uh, most evolutionary biologists would tell you just doesn't actually yeah. exist, but that he thought existed. Um, and it was part of a, a debate that has long since since ceased to be a debate in evolutionary biology that was occurring. Yeah. Was it back in like the 1930s? Yeah, 30s, 40s, around there, yeah. Right around the start yeah, so of the, like the a nearly, synthesis. Nearly 100 years ago, um, mm -hmm. a debate that has long since stopped being a debate. But anyway... I think then the, the question then becomes, well, I, I'm not still really sure what you mean by a kind. If a fish were to evolve into a different kind, what would that look like? An amphibian. Just stick with would, standard textbook. Else, Can I also ask a question? High school. Um, uh -huh. So when you, when, you say, when you say fish, I've been doing a lot of videos about fish recently. There are a lot of fish, and we are more closely related to some of these fish than they are to other fish. So, like, genetically, mm -hmm. you are more closely related to lungfish and coelacanths than either of them are to goldfish, for instance. And you're more closely related to a goldfish than they are to sharks, right? So, even though these are all fish in the sort of traditional sense of, like, they're swimming scaly animals uh, with, with fins, like, fish encompasses a lot of things, right? Way, yeah. more, way more diversity than is, like, among all tetrapods, basically. Yeah, right. You're, you're that, much more similar saying? to a salamander than a salamander so, is to a goldfish. Sorry, Jackson. Yes. Just to clarify, what was your question? My my, my question <laughs> is question. my question is here. Um, you say like you say fish, like, but fish is mm. a very large grouping of increasingly distantly related organisms. So, like, when you say fish, what do you mean specifically? Do you mean all well, fish just, or No, just because like a lungfish yeah, going I, I, to an amphibian is a lot I, easier. Than, I think like, I might be able to clarify. Yeah, you're, you're, that, you're yeah. talking about you're talking about the the genetic code is is uh, much closer to humans than yeah. than the genetic code is to say fish to lizards, uh, and that's that still doesn't that still doesn't uh, there's that doesn't mean that doesn't prove evolution just because it's like that. Well, I mean that on its own probably wouldn't, I guess. But no. the right, my my, exactly. my all, issue to saying. kind of go back to to what we were talking about earlier with the information thing is like I don't think we ever really we got a definition. Or you mentioned that like mutations count as information, and it no, seems no, like I, I said they. I, I, that's that's kind of what you were saying. I that confused me. I've never heard anybody okay. uh, use mutations in that way. To me, mutation has always meant something that's that's wrong that that this that's destroying 
that's destroying a little bit of information. No, you know, so uh, the reason uh, that no one uses it that way is you can have like duplications. A gene duplication is a mutation. It is a, that's why mm -hmm. duplicate, or sorry, that's why the word mutation is always defined or has always been in all the genetics class and whatnot that I've taken as merely a change in the genetic code. It, it's very mm -hmm. broad because you can have lots of different types of mutations. They can have lots of different effects. Uh, that some mutations are bad, as you said, like, you know, cancer is a, one example, uh, or, you know, cystic fibrosis or whatever. Those are examples of bad ones. Mm -hmm. Most mutations uh, are neutral. They have no effect on you whatsoever. Like, you know, something very, very, very minor, uh, or they're what's called like effectively, uh, you know, neutral. Um, and then some are beneficial. They actually confer a survival advantage to a population. And we, you know, witness this mm. in, in various laboratory experiments. So that's why the term mutation is, is very broad. It, it has to cast a wide net or otherwise you have to come up with like different words to capture like a beneficial mutation versus a neutral mutation versus a deleterious mutation. Like you have to come up with another term for mutation, which is why I think it's, it's easier just to say mutation, but with this effect. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so. So back, that, to the, uh, back to the fish, you know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, news, Darwin's finches had all revert, reverted back to a normal beak. No, that's not what happened. So, what you're referring to is, uh, so what you're referring to is a, um, uh, basically there's I'm referring, I'm by, putting this with a fish. I'm, 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 uh, trying, just trying to, never mind, go ahead, explain it. Well, uh, well, the, the the thing with the with the finches was that there, it was one population that uh, the the students of the grants were studying uh, in the Galapagos on Daphne Major. It was I think it was Geospiza, was Magna it Fortis, Rostris? or ma maybe it was Magna Rostris. Anyway, it was one of the finch species. It was basically they were studying one population during an El Nino and during the uh, during the dry part. Uh, they like or sorry, during the, the wet season, during the wet season, basically mm -hmm. these populations were able to have limited interbreeding between each other because you had a wide amount of variability. Basically, if you had a, if you're a species with a big beak and you had a, an offspring who had a small beak, uh, you could survive because there was a lot of vegetation, you would do fine, it didn't matter. But then when the dry season came, basically all the variants who were like in between the extremes got wiped out because suddenly the mm -hmm. only thing that was left to eat was like the very hard seeds, like the, the little, I can't remember what they were. They have like spines on them. Uh, so you have to either cactus have very... Seeds. The place is lousy with cactus. Well, it, no, cactus was one of them, but this wasn't a cactus. It was a different kind of plant. But at any rate, mm -hmm. yeah, so basically you had the ones who can eat cactus, which was a different species, or, you know, the versus the ones who had to eat these other seeds, which were a different species. But everything in between those got wiped out by the dry season because they were too inefficient, right? And so you have this kind mm -hmm. of circle around a mean, basically. Um, but that's that's we do see that sometimes like that does happen obviously uh as in that case but we do also see examples where we do have like divergent selection like we have selection away from the mean and to a new species uh one of the hey, examples that I... in north america right now apple maggot yeah, flies sure. uh, versus, oh yeah uh, with apple maggot flies. flies yeah there's a current currently there's right, a species yeah. right now uh, that are often called apple maggot flies but sometimes they're called hawthorn berry flies and the reason is that um, ancestrally, the species of fly would lay their eggs on hawthorn flowers, which are native to North America. And <clears throat> the larva basically is a parasite that just eats the fruit. That's how it, you know, grows up to be big enough to turn into a fly is it just eats the hawthorn berry. Um, but in, I believe it was the 1790s, a pastor from England brought some apples over because he liked apples, I suppose. And he was like, yeah, I want apples here in the new world. So we planted the first apples that ever appeared in North America. And so since the 19, uh, or sorry, the 1790s or so, some hawthorn berry flies have adapted to instead lay their uh, eggs on apple flowers. But there's very little overlap between the blooming season of hawthorn berries or hawthorn bushes and apple trees. And so as time has gone on, two populations have emerged in North America, which have virtually no overlap in their breeding season. One is the apple maggot flies and one is the hawthorn berry flies. And so because these populations or flies are right now, starting to no longer breed together, they're starting to diverge genetically. And over time, they will almost certainly become two different species unless, I guess, either apples or hawthorn berries go extinct, but neither of them seem to be at risk of that anytime soon. So I'm not too worried about that. So we're, we're watching a speciation event happen right now where mutations are building up 
in the Hawthorne berry flies that aren't being shared with the apple maggot flies. And there are um, mutations building up in the apple maggot flies that aren't building up in the Hawthorne maggot flies. And they're becoming different species in the wild right now. I mean, it's just happening. You can go, um, if you ever see a, an apple with a big worm in it that you've got from North America, chances are that's one of those uh, flies. If I can jump in here, I think that's kind of going to lean into that micro versus macro. Like the, the information it was for to go between one and the other is mm. already there, particularly with the finches would demonstrate that basically from, from Daniel's point of view. And correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but no, the if the finches were already this way and adapted to be this way, then being able to go back to this other thing shouldn't necessarily be a problem in either both for evolution or for creationism it should be should be a non-issue either way but um daniel can you get us what what you were uh trying to say about the fish oh i was just relating the finches to the fish okay well that, so the fish cool. could that, you're, that. you're, you're saying the fish new, could new not have eyes currently and that if you were to take them out of that environment they would adapt to get eyes again uh, possibly i don't know sure uh, that, okay. That's just that's, to me. That's an exper to me. That's an experiment in cellular development. Will will that act, is there something in the fish that will will help them repair what they lost because they need it? I have good. I have good news for you. I would. Uh, the Institute for Creation Research is currently doing that experiment, and so far, what they have found is that uh, Mexican cave tetras get a bit of a tan when you grow them in the light, which <laughs> is a result. Yeah, I'd be very shocked result. if. I mean, I'd be very shocked if they if they could, because typically, so there's a, I really hate this phrase, but there's a, a, a law in evolution uh, that's called Dalo's Law of Irreversibility. It's not a law, it's a statistical, uh, it's a statement of statistical probability. It's basically the idea is that I mean, once you go down a certain... Jackson. No, that's true. That's fair. So, like, the concept of laws is, is dumb. But um, basically, the idea is that yeah. once you go down a certain evolutionary path, you've accrued a certain number of mutations. The odds that you are able to revert down that path, you're able to... It's like you start at A, you know, go all the way down to B. The odds that you could go from B all the way back to A, like, and once you've accrued a certain number of mutations, it just becomes, like, pretty small. Very low. And yeah. it's not that they're just simply shutting off, like all of like the it's not like it's one mutation where they just shut it off it's like they like they get to a point and then it's like it's just physically like unable to keep building they've accrued so many mutations in this particular region that they've like destroyed it it'd be kind of like you know trying to go back to like you know a dinosaur mouth from a bird beak like is it possible yeah oh, i'd be surprised if that's why when they're I mean, like you know oh birds have broken the bird gene for uh, enamel is broken. Birds can't make enamel. You can actually get a right, yeah. to develop dentin capped uh, roots. Like you can get um, a pulpy root with capped and dentin on a bird in embryo by just switching back on the teeth genes, but they never develop dent, uh, enamel. So yeah, probably not. I Which did want to point out a, with regards to the finches. Thing about birds. I'm sorry. Oh, that uh, there is actually say, it's a, a, it's an interesting. <laughs> I'll let you go, Dapper. It's you the vmix delay. I was just saying, it's just interesting from an, a, a biology standpoint that birds, in fact, uh, all birds have the genes to make teeth. They just don't activate them. But they also have a broken enamel gene, which is hard to explain unless birds all ancestrally had teeth. And if they all ancestrally had teeth, and they all, by the way, their, their um, enamel gene is broken in exactly the same way in every bird. Um, so if they all started out with teeth, with a functional enamel gene and they all broke in the same way then it would should mean that the the only really realistic way to explain that is that all birds shared a common ancestor and that common ancestor of all modern birds had a broken enamel gene i, I don't know how else to explain that and the same thing is true for like vitamin c genes and um monkeys so basically all monkeys including apes including humans have a broken vitamin c synthesis gene which is why they're all susceptible to scurvy if you don't feed your gorilla enough vitamin C, it will get scurvy, just like any human sailor. Um, and so, like, th with things like that, where it's like, okay, we're not adding new information by most definitions that I've heard. But on the other hand, it's very hard to explain why such a wide group of animals, like all birds or all monkeys, would have exactly the same damage to exactly the same genes in exactly the same place in their genome, other than sharing an a, a common ancestor where this breakage occurred. 
And that's it. I'm done. I'll shut up again. I happened to read that particular scientific paper where they discovered they could um, turn on the dormant genes in chickens to make them grow teeth. And uh, I just, I, those, those aren't, they're not teeth with enamel. <laughs> so they are, they're just, they're just literally right. uh, ridges. They're just ridges. Right. Uh, but th that's the thing though. They're not just ridges because we have birds with ridges on their beaks. Like actually lots of birds, mm -hmm. some geese have ridges. There's yeah, the, um, sure. there's the comb. I think it's the comb. Oh, I, I, well, you can see the pictures of them. Yeah, you can but see the, the pictures is, the of difference them. Is, the difference is tooth, a tooth is a specific structure, right? A tooth is actually, it's a dermal structure. And so when it actually um, in, is embedded in the cranium, so in your, you know, your maxillary and premaxillary teeth, it actually well, has well, to hold on, have... hold on. Teeth, teeth, teeth is is just what they they called it. They weren't real teeth. They weren't no, teeth. No, as, tooth as tooth refers teeth. to a so tooth refers to a specific structure. Tooth refers to a specific structure that is homologous among all all vertebrates. Basically, it's like it's this is one very mm, specific. Not all vertebrates. Or all, sorry, not all vertebrates, all nathostomes. All nathostomes. Yeah, there you go. Um, Which but, is yeah, like, close uh, to all yeah. vertebrates, but not quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, go ahead, like, uh, lamprey The real teeth drama. Also the real so drama. The lamprey teeth are not teeth. Yeah. Yeah, so the reason I'm pointing this out is there, there is a difference between beak serrations, which is what it's usually called when you get bumps on a bird beak, and actual teeth. And what they have developed are, in fact, teeth. Because a tooth has a particular structure, right? It has a pulp, mm -hmm. which has a blood supply and is made of living tissue. Then it has a dentin, which is a primarily proteinaceous covering that helps strengthen the tooth. And then over that, it has a very hard but somewhat brittle enamel coating. And the reason that you have all of these structures is basically for structural integrity as well as keeping it alive. Because if your tooth just rots out, well, it's going to fall out and that's bad. Um, and when... These genes are flipped back on in, say, chickens, which is an example of a bird that has, we've done this experiment on in particular. What develops is the pulp and the dentin, which means it's actually developing a tooth, but it fails to develop the enamel coating. But when you have a bird like um, a, a goose with a serrated beak, which actually several geese uh, species have serrated beaks, it's not that unusual. Um, <clears throat> what's actually happening is the keratin, which is its own particular protein of the beak, which is what the beak is primarily made of. It's a, keratin sheath around the jaw that actually has extensions that itself grow out kind of like a fingernail because your fingernail is made of the yeah. same basic chemical as a bird beak. And so when we look at this experiment in say chickens and we look at the genomes of other birds, all of which that we've tested for seem to have these same genes for uh, teeth. There's a significant biochemical and developmental difference between the teeth that we can switch on an embryo and the beak serration, which means they're not the same thing. They're not coded for by the, by the same genes. They don't have the same underlying chemical or anatomical structure. They're not made by the same uh, structures embryologically. And so we remain in this situation where all birds, all of them, have the genes to make teeth, including what would be a gene to make enamel. But because that gene is broken, when you flip on the tooth genes in birds, they start to develop teeth, but they're basically naked. It would be a very painful existence to have teeth that are just exposed dentin because they would be very susceptible to horrible injuries. And I don't know if you've ever had a toothache, but it is not a fun time. And I would not want to be a bird with a mouth full of aching teeth. That just sounds like torture. So what, what, what would a creation predict or how would creation explain, I suppose, is really what I'm asking, the existence of these widespread pseudogenes that seem to just be the remnant of an enamel gene in all birds, as well as the ability of birds to, if the correct, you know, switch is flipped, basically an embryo, to just start developing well, teeth that never quite finish. The paper, the paper emphasized many times could be, might be, maybe leftover dinosaur DNA. Uh, and the creationists would look at that and say, well, that's the way they were created so that they can adapt to their environment. So and, it's, uh, okay, God created. Objectively, it doesn't work. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying. So, the the model that you just seem to propose to me is that because mm -hmm. God wanted birds to be able to adapt, He gave them genes to make teeth, but He intentionally broke all of their enamel genes in exactly the same way, so that even though they could grow dentin and tooth pulp, which is the middle, you know, the middle part of the tooth. 
They can't make enamel, making their teeth that they can switch on useless. So what adaptive ability does this give to birds that they can make teeth that can't actually function in the real world because they're not hard enough to actually be used for food processing? Well, first off, I don't disagree. Like, like for instance, I think with one of you guys, we were talking about dogs. And I said German Shepherds and, uh, and uh, whatever, bull, whatever the other kind of dog was. I don't disagree like that a, if you were to separate those two people. <laughs> people. Yeah. yeah. People, I don't disagree okay, yeah. that if you, were to, if you were to separate those two dogs on different continents for thousands of years, that eventually they would not be able to breed with one another. Uh, and uh, that kind of speciation that you're talking about. Uh, uh, but that doesn't change the fact that they're still dogs. And I don't, I right. would not disagree right. that. Uh, right. And I also, but that's the thing. That's I also don't disagree. Evolution. Uh, well, Dapper, let him, let him finish. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm sorry. But, that's, but there's a vast difference between that and that dog turning into a kangaroo eventually. So just, those are just those are an example. Different things. Like, so when you say there still be dogs, that's true. We agree with that. I mean, like, that's, that's, that is a central uh, aspect of evolution that monophyly is true, right? Like that mm -hmm. all dogs share a common ancestor, which itself is a carnivoran, which was a mammal, which was an amnio, which was a tetrapod, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's a central idea of evolution. We are primates because we have all the characteristics, both genetic and morphological, that are diagnostic of primate. Well, except, except for Dapper over here. He's a dinosaur. But like yeah, the rest dinosaur. of us. We're all primates. Oh, like that's we we expect that a primate is never going to turn into a like a different currently extant animal. That's just not yeah. a not a prediction of evolution. A prediction. Oh, or okay. a, a, pick, some, found... pick something. Pick something besides primate. Then okay, I picked the marsupial. Whatever. <laughs> sure, we could go with okay. marsupials. I mean, like a kangaroo is never going to turn yeah, yeah. into a wombat, no. right? They're they're too. Because I said a dog. Because I said dog to kangaroo. <laughs> I said dog to kangaroo. That's nice. I mean, we, so we could say I, I anything, right? Like, one of the confusions is... Well, you gotta, the, but the thing is, you have to have a fossil record for that. And you don't. Well, yeah, so we do. For, I mean, for we have a fossil kinda, record for, for dogs no, or for canids. have a fossil record for... I'm sorry. Yeah, but you, pretty, but you don't have a fossil record for, for uh, literally what would have to be thousands and thousands of gradual changes from one kind of animal to another. You have just these... Okay. Here this is. It looks we we think it probably turned into this so over over I mean, time. And that, that's the fossil of, record. So I mean, we do have lots and lots. I mean, a transitional fossil is like a an organism who has characteristics of the like presumed like ancestor and descendant like clades, right? That's what we mean when we say transitional if, fossil. If right? if that's what you have, well, no, because you, you have to have the transitions between that and the other. So that's where you start them. getting into things. Well, so if you start doing that, like, oh, well, every time we have a transition, well, you have to find the transition between the next two. Like, that starts moving the goalpost into, like, the moon, basically. And we, we just can't that's a, nothing. Yeah, but that's, they're huge. That's that's a huge transition. So I mean, let's you're, you're not talking instance. something that would... Mm -hmm. Let's say canids, for instance. You mentioned canids. So canids do actually have... Uh, they have a fossil record, right? There are like borophagines and uh, there are lots of stem canids like Hesperocyon, things that are less dog-like than anything around to, or less canid-like, I should say, not necessarily dog because they're basically derived with respect to foxes too. Uh, so you have like Hesperocyon, for, which is basically derived, so it's primitive in its characteristics with respect to all extant canids, right? So that's something we could mm -hmm. reasonably say is like, it's ancestral. It has. It's a transitional fossil between earlier, uh, like the meacids, for instance, some of whom are more dog-like and some of whom are more cat-like. Because meacid, the group meacids, is is what's called paraphyletic. It's basically a grade. So some meacids are more dog-like. They're more like Hesperocyon, which is more like are modern canids and then some meacids are less dog-like so they're more like what would have been the common ancestor of of like cats and dogs something like dormalocyon uh or like uh i forget what the others it's been a long time since i looked at carnivore and uh data on this Actually, but being able to pull out dormalocyon is pretty good anyway so don't don't feel too um, bad so you have like yeah dormalocyon which like is in the eocene which has some characteristics diagnostic of carnivorans, like the carnassials. Uh, that's a, a diagnostic character of, of carnivorans. But 
At the same time, it does not have all the derived characteristics of either the dogs or the cats, right? So it's got some characteristics in common, not all of them. And then we can pull it, back it, further. It, but it's just, it's just like, you know, I remember watching this uh, PBS show on evolution with my kids once. The guy had a hundred skulls laid out on a table. Perfect transition from one to the other. And I turned to my kids and said, those are all modern animals right there. They might have a fossil or two mixed in with them. And sure enough, he says, yeah, these are all, that's, that's not, that is, that's not proof. Mm. You, you have to have some kind of, of way There's to show that, hey, wait a minute. On today. Well, huh? if I can jump in real quick. So there what you're saying is... There's nothing like Dormalis Ion around today. There's nothing like it around. Like, yeah, we but have what, the host, Jackson. what he's asking okay. for is a un, a near unbroken chain from If you want one that, ant we can do that, but the organisms yeah. that do that are not interesting to anyone. So like, well, we're talking about phytoplankton. Like, I guarantee, if you want to yeah. talk for Aminifera, I am all about it, but nobody, nobody ever wants to talk for Aminifera. Rip. Yeah, nobody likes it's phytoplankton. We're, Rip nobody plankton. wants to talk about that. I can show you. Let, like, let's stick to animals and not let's stick to animals and not plants. Okay, but that's kind of the point, right? Like, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Josh. So, if you were to go in, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, because I want to make sure that you feel like you get a fair amount of time to speak. Your you're asking for a near unbroken chain of one kind to another kind, or from one ancestor to two different species. Either way, either way. So we I mean, have things okay. like that. In Dane, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We, we do have things like that in the fossil record. I mean, we even have them for some mammals and some uh, ceratopsians, for instance. For instance, if you look yeah, at do. the chasmosaurines, which are a group. So you have like Triceratops, all those guys with the big frill and the horns. So we have, there are some groups of them. One group is called the, the Chasmosaurines. Basically, the Chasmosaurines are so well represented in the fossil record that you can actually see species to species transitions between them. They're that well represented. So you have like Achillosaurus and, and Eniosaurus uh, and like uh, uh, Pachyrhinosaurus. And they're all like, you can see how they very gradually like, take the the... The horns, the like uh, horns right above the eyes, and they like slowly, like kind of, what is it? I don't remember if they pull them down or like pull them out or whatever. It's basically they very slightly change them, uh, and you can slowly see that uh, there is what Thalassocnus, the uh, aquatic sloth, who yep. has what's called a chrono species. So you can see, literally, like they become progressively more aquatic over time. Uh, there's that weird goat from uh, from Spain, uh, uh, Myotragus. Which, like, the eyes... Oh. Okay, so it's a goat that ends up on an island, or sorry, an archipelago, where there are no predators. And so it goes from the ancestral goat condition, which is where the eyes are on the sides of the head because they're prey, uh, and it slowly moves its eyes back towards the front because there can are I no just predators. Say that so I, need... Can I just say that I hate that? Can I just... Can I point yeah, out that works. that sounds look up, terrible and I hate everything about it? Look up pictures of Myotragus. It looks like it no. wants to ask you three riddles for its gold or whatever. No. Nope. yeah, we, we have no, I, want the, I want the... I want the word... I want the uh, dinosaur Cassio something. How do you spell that? Cas... C-H-A-S-M-O-S-A-U-R-I-N-E. Casmosaurine. If you look up... S so C H A S M O S A U R I N E, Casmosaurine. Who names this shit? Paleontologists. Paleontologists. Ner dinosaur nerds some with lots of time on their hands. If you asshole. look up that term, if you look up Casmosaurine and anagenesis, which is the process of having speciation without like splitting off into multiple branches, it's just one like one line of descent. Then you will find papers on that. And you can see these like species to species to species transitions. Um, additionally, I know I said it earlier, um, you can do that with phytoplankton. That phytoplankton, uh, like foraminifera, radiolarians, coccolithophores, uh, all these guys have truly like awe inspiring fossil records where, again, you can literally see transitions between species because instead of, unlike us, unlike us, you know, mammals, where all of our hard parts are, you know, either our teeth or on the inside, and most of us is meaty stuff. Um, phytoplankton are like almost all hard stuff, right? They have this really tough shell, or we call it a shell, it's a test, technically is the right word, 
Um, and that is what gets preserved. And they're like literally mountains of these, like the white cliffs of Dover are literally just mountains of phytoplankton fossils. That's, that's why they're the white cliffs. And, um, he, and you can, he know, means literally, literally it's physically, that's what they are. They're just yeah. basically a pile of shells. You can start like at one end of the cliffs and like work your way like across and see like, okay, over here we have uh, like this particular species of clam. And then as we move, it acquires like, you know, another little notch on it, then another little notch then another, you can do that. Uh, there's like Chesapecten, which is uh, on the other side uh, of the, of the Atlantic, um, which is, a, which is actually a, a scallop and you can do that sort of thing. So these do exist. These like, very finely graded fossil records. They do exist, but it's largely for things nobody ever wants to talk about, which is why they don't get brought up. Everyone wants to jump to Tiktaalik and Australopithecus. It's like, yeah, those are good examples, but like we have a much better fossil record for, for Aminifera for the last 200 million years, you know? Yeah, but they don't look good on posters. That's the problem. That's true. For Aminifera, don't look good on posters. I'm pretty sure uh, things like PBS have a, have a hard enough time maintaining their government funding when they aren't boring. So it make them <laughs> more true. boring, That's they're going to have a hard day. <laughs> um, there's, there's also among the um, aminoids, there's a great fossil record that's similar. Mm -hmm. And we're talking for hundreds of millions of years, going from the very basal aminoids from which we get both ammonites in the, you know, like the uh, late Mesozoic and as well as modern ammonites today. But when you go on the, sorry, modern Nautiluses today, not Ammonites, those are extinct. But when you go, you can watch the sutures go from the very basic, simple sutures that uh, Nautiluses today still have. And you can watch them go to gonatitic sutures where they're a bit squiggly. And then go to serotitic sutures where the squiggles themselves have squiggles. All the way to the amino aminitic sutures with the true Ammonites where the squiggles are like they're like fractal designs are so ridiculously complex and you can watch that happen smoothly as you go up through the geologic column. It's all there. Now, if you are asking for every single lineage to have this kind of transitional series, like we have with many phytoplankton, like we have with uh, nautiloids, like we have with some chasmosaurine uh, dinosaurs, like we have with Thalassochnus, and to some extent, like we have with humans, I would say that the human fossil record is, about as smooth as anyone could ever hope for. But we're not going to get that for everything, for the simple reason that not everything that was preserved in the fossil record, even under the creation assumption of um, a flood causing the false record, you still have no reason to think that every single species would have a preserved representative. Um, so if, if your question is, do we have such uh, evolutionary sequences? The answer is an resounding yes. If the question is, do we have such a sequence for every single currently living lineage? Well, then the answer is no. But I would argue that because evolution predicts that some such sequences should be found, and the fact that no creationists until they were found ever predicted that they should be found, that does count as a point in favor of evolution. I'd have to look at the things you're talking about because I've not looked into those. So It's fair from, uh, from what I can you, tell. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think that's totally fair, especially since a lot of what what been talked about, particularly with more full... Um, structures from point A to point B is just stuff that does not, like, it's hard to find. If you're not studying the topic, you're not really even going to know where to look. And I think part of that is just due to, you know, people like things that are exciting, and people don't think Plankton is exciting unless it's on Spongebob. True. Even then, is he but the most exciting character? Him and Squidward are pretty great. Him and Squidward. Okay. Are or or urchins. Urchins are another thing where you know you have lots of very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, these organisms have a very hard test and a very good fossil record. But again, who gives a care about Microster from the Permian? You know who cares, right? No one's looking at that. I do, Jackson. Um, I, do. I well, I mean, you know, we do, yeah. But most people, no one cares. Um, and it's, true. it's that's that's like that's why it's uh, conversations with. Uh, creations about transitional fossils very rarely like go here for the simple fact that everyone's heard of Tiktaalik because Tiktaalik is flashy, mm -hmm. Tiktaalik is cool, and is part of, again, a, a rather well-represented uh, fossil sequence. You have things that are more fishy and then you have things that are more tetrapod. So it's a good example, certainly. It's a good sequence to use. But like, in terms of things with a better sequence, yeah, we have lots of stuff with a better sequence, but eh, you know, eh, it is what it is. It's just, it's just the nature of of, the uh, evolutionists are right? hiding it from everybody. 
It's true. Well, they, they, talk, they, they, they talk about it, but they talk about it more on, on lines with, with geology and the geological column and, yeah. and Noah's flood and all that. And uh, yeah. that, that's where yeah. that's where it would be discussed. And um, uh, that's what I say. I have to look into it. Yeah, no, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I've looked into that's that. Fair. And, and here's the thing. We're, it's rarely, rarely do we get actually someone taking us up on this offer. But we're happy to come back and talk to people that we've talked to previously after they've gone mm -hmm. ahead and taken a look at some of the stuff that we gave. Because look, Jackson and I can spit a ridiculous number of scientific names at you of various organisms that the average person has never even heard of and absolutely does not care about. And we get that. So if that is something that you want to look up and then come back to us after you've like looked into things like Thalassochnus or Chasmosaurines or whatever... I'd be happy to do that again. But I think the takeaway should be that at least as far as most paleontologists and just biologists broadly are concerned, the question, do we have a smooth evolutionary sequence for at least some lineages is very much a yes. And if you wanted to say that we didn't, it would be incumbent upon anyone making such a claim to go through literally every single such series and show why for some reason it's a big ask. It isn't what we say it is, which is, and I want to be clear, what we mean by transitional uh, species, right, is a species which contains the primitive characters that a group, that a, a later group retains, but has only some of the derived characteristics that that later group has. So, for instance, um, if you were to pick, say, uh, what's a really good one? We'll go with mammals, right? Because people are familiar with mammals. So if you want to say, uh, I would say, contest that uh, Gorgonopsids which were really cool saber-toothed predators from the Permian, are transitional between sort of basic tetrapods and mammals. Well, I would say, okay, well, they have all of the basic tetrapod traits, right? They have the four limbs, they have the postanal tail, they've got the uh, pentadactyl, which is five finger or five toe, uh, you know, hands and, and uh, well, manis and pez, you know, hand and uh, feet. Um, they've got all the same bones that you would expect from the basic tetrapod skull, um, but when they get to the mammal side, okay, well, they have some mammal things, right? Like they have the synapsid condition. They have different teeth in different positions in the jaw. Like they have incisors versus canines versus premolars versus molars. Um, but they also lack certain features that mammals have. For instance, they don't have a distinction between the thoracic vertebrae and the dorsal vertebrae. The rib cage just goes all the way down to the hip. Um, they lack the complex inner ear that mammals have, the three inner ear bones. They only have one inner ear bone. Um, they still have the more basic tetrapod jaw joint between the quadrate and the uh, articular, which is close to the serrate, doesn't matter. They don't have, you know, that dentary squamosal jaw joint that you do as a mammal, that I don't as a non-mammal. Um, so they are intermediate because they share some of the derived characteristics that we've identified from mammals. They share all of the primitive characteristics that mammals also share with the rest of tetrapods, but they don't have all of the characteristics of mammals that we would expect of a true mammal, which is why we say that they're transitional. Now, if you want to make the statement, I don't think Gorgonopsids are ancestral to mammals, I'm going to agree with you. I don't think they are either. But that's not what we mean by transitional. So it's important to remember that when we say something is transitional, we don't need it to technically be the actual ancestor. Because for one thing, given that the fossil record is very incomplete by everyone's account, it's unlikely that we're going to find the literal actual ancestor, but because organisms tend to be, exist in larger populations of, you know, multiple species of similar types, when we find the anatomy that we would expect of an ancestor, we call it transitional because the actual ancestor was probably very like that thing. And I feel like I've gone off on a tangent and I'm sorry, I'll shut up. Well, that kind of a little bit, this, this, that's a little bit deceiving for the layman, wouldn't you think? I mean, I, no, I don't I know. Don't so at all. so when, if, if someone says that um, this galaxy is 9 billion light years away, when what they actually mean is that it has a particular redshift, which at that distance is actually how we measure astronomical distances because it becomes very hard to define actual distances when it, you take into account things like inflation and relativity. I don't think that's deceiving because most people don't want to hear a redshift value because it doesn't mean anything to them. Similarly, I, I don't think that using a shorthand for transitional and saying this is, you know, this group is ancestral to this later group, that is actually probably true. Um, 
And so, yeah, it's it's one of those things where like, look, most people are never going to get to the point in their lives where they know enough about evolutionary biology that they can just fluidly read evolutionary biology papers without having to look things up and be confused and ask for help. In fact, most evolutionary biologists don't quite make it there. Most of them still have trouble reading other papers in evolutionary biology. It's a very complicated field. And I don't think the fact that people don't understand it is on its own going to be deceptive. Um, I, for I instance, if you're curious got, about it, you can find I, out. To be fair, I think he's got a little bit of a point in that it is difficult when it comes to science communication. Right, so scientific communication is from a field to a layman is something that's very, very hard. And certainly the jargon and the obnoxious names that things get called makes it very difficult. And like, why? Is there a reason? Is there like a reason for that besides just kind of, you know, fucking with people a little bit? I mean, no, 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 no. I, you, so the, the point of, of terminology, and I actually I make this point in a video I'm, I'm, we're going to put out shortly because... um. Uh, Jackson, I got, very mad. I got very mad at the word ambulacrarian because it's stupid. The word ambulacrarian <laughs> means possessing ambulacral grooves, and it refers to hemichordates who don't have ambulacral grooves and echinoderms who do. So why would you call the total Ooh. group ambulacraria? That's stupid. But anyway, so the Agreed. point of so the point of terminology of scientific terminology is to be precise and accurate, right? You want to yes. you want to mean what you um, say. You want to have a very among, particular. What? Sorry, I mean, it's among people who work in that field or are knowledgeable right. in that field. Among right? people who work in that field, when you say a thing, you want to mean one particular thing. You don't want to say, that, and that's kind of the issue we take with like kinds of information, right? These terms, we're not sure what they mean, uh, and every time we've interacted with people who claim to have a definition of them, we're left with more questions about what they mean. Uh, like if you say yeah i still don't know what they well, anyway, what mean by either of them the Daniel. point the point the point that i'm trying to make is um these terms Sorry. need to have specific meanings now obviously they're like in a sense they're arbitrary right like a term can mean anything so, but we want to have a term that's useful it refers to something that exists in the real world that we can point to and say ah this is this and well, so with terms like transitional mm -hmm. i think in the literature like I don't think saying that a, a an organism that possesses characteristics, some characteristics that are ancestral and some characteristics that are derived, I don't think there's anything deceptive about that. I think it can be difficult to explain to people that, no, this thing isn't your ancestor. It has characteristics of what your ancestor would have had. And maybe that, sure, maybe that adds an extra layer to understanding, but I don't think that's deceptive. If that I makes sense. I think that if I can clarify this a little bit, it is that there is a specific jargon in a field of science the same way you have a specific jargon in a field of like electricians well sure. they'll use words and terms that don't really make sense to anybody outside of that field so like if i were to say a fob you're gonna think about x y and z in x y and z field depending on who i'm talking to if i use the word theory mm -hmm. it's going to mean a different thing if i'm talking about a theory about a game or i'm talking about a game theory or if i'm talking sure. about a theory amongst sure. biology or if i'm talking about a theory in music these are all different terms sure but again i don't think that's deceptive i think that's no i don't think it's deceptive of... but i think it's a fair okay, well that's complaint. the word that was used previously the yeah word that i was think used it's was a deceptive. I think it's a fair complaint. Well, because when most people, when most, most people think of transitional fossils, they are thinking mm -hmm. of a direct ancestor leading up to what you see now, or leading up to what you see in the fossil record. So you have uh, T. Rex. Okay, where's the I mean, where's the transitional fossils leading up to T. Rex? Uh, and so where are the transitional? Well, so. That the answer to that is like Ali but, simi but similar. Uh, okay, but having that's a different. That's vastly different than saying they have characteristics, similar characteristics. Or well, you have to have those characteristics to be labeled as a transitional, right? To be to be even considered yeah. as ancestral to something else, you have to have the characteristics that we're describing, right? You have to have some characteristics that are ancestral and some characteristics that are derived. Otherwise, how, how would you define it? How would you measure right. it? Also, so it has to I, have I those characteristics. Add. If, if the complaint is evolutionary biologists are not doing a terrific job of explaining their science to the general public, I will not disagree with you there. There is sure. definitely a sense in which evolutionary biologists tend to fail to uh, adequately explain 
their ideas to the public. So I, if, if you want to say, I don't think it's an intentional deceit. I do think it is a failing right. on the part of evolutionary biologists. And if, if you want to say that I think evolutionary biologists should do a better job of explaining what they mean, I am with you 100%. Because I know some evolutionary biologists. And when I sometimes see them explain things to people who aren't evolutionary biologists, I'm like, come on, man. There, there's no way that you're getting across the meaning that you're trying to because you're using terms. Like when in people say plesiomorphic, who does that? Yeah, no, exactly. Anyone yeah, who, who just starts that? out talking about sure. plesiomorphy with the general public without defining it, that person should probably be pilloried. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. What? <laughs> I think I have a question from the chat that I think falls align with a little bit what Daniel's been saying so far, and I'm gonna, it's mostly a complaint or a criticism, but I'm gonna try to raise it as a question so that maybe we can get a proper answer. Um, with the example of goats that you had provided, Jackson, how do you delineate when the goat has changed from a goat to something else, either backwards or forwards? Oh, I mean, it's it's morphological characters, right? It's the, you look at, like, for instance, one of the characteristics is the eyes. The position of the eyes in myotragus, which is the example I was using, are, they start out here, like goats, or artiodactyls have, and then they move forward. And you can actually w look at the changes in the skull, so you can see the movement of the orbits from more towards the side to more in the center. That's so how between you determine... point A and point B, when is it not a goat yeah. anymore? Oh, it's, it's always, always a, goat. a goat. And that's what we were saying earlier with with evolution says you can never leave your ancestry, right? You, if you're a goat, you're always going to be a goat. You're always going to be a mammal, yeah. a tetrapod, a eukaryote, so, blah, blah, blah. So the way this works is you can diverge within groups that have already been established, but you cannot leave previous groups. So um, an analogy I would say is like, imagine an append only file, right? So this is, let's say you have a text file, right? So you it's only append, which means you can only add new entries at the end of the file. Okay, and so you send this append-only text file to the four of us, right? So Chesh gets a copy, Jackson gets a copy, Daniel gets a copy, and I get a copy. And each of us get to randomly enter any one character at the end of this append-only file, right? And then each of us send it to, say, two people, and they get to randomly append a character. At no point in this process, no matter how long it goes on, are the original characters from earlier on in the chain going to go away because it's append-only, right? You, you've physically can't alter that file that way because it's append only. That's kind of how evolution works, right? You can append new groups onto the older groups that have already existed, but no group is ever going to be able to leave those old groups. So for instance, if humans are primates, then even if, and we, we'll just assume evolution is true, and we'll assume that like, you know, Mr. Musk's fever dream of Mars is true. Even if humans go to Mars, become a new Martian species of human, they'll still be primates. And even if those Martian humans then go on to colonize Alpha Centauri Prime 3 or whatever, I don't know, and evolve into yet another species, they'll still be primates. And eventually, even if they go on to colonize some ocean world and fully adapt to being completely aquatic and they develop, you know, echolocation like a dolphin and they have flippers instead of hands and feet and they get a blowhole... I, they'll still be primates because you don't get to uh, change the previous entries in your taxonomy. Those have to stay, but you can get new entries into the taxonomy. You pe can become a particular kind of primate, a particular type of primate. That's why not all primates are the same. That's why baboons aren't the same as humans, aren't the same as Marikis, which is a South American monkey. doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, evolution only ever appends new entries into the, Clades or the taxonomy. It never erases the old entries. So a goat will always well, what produce I'm, goats. And that's what I'm saying. That has to be proven. There has there has to be some kind of uh, observable science, not not looking at fossils, not looking at which not looking at oh well, we have these and these and these are similar. You have to be able to look at the at the genome itself and the cells and all of that and see, hey, there's a mechanism in here that will do that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so, mutation and selection so and drift. What we were talking about, yeah. So with mutations, like if you, if you, like, let's say we just decide to go and like, you know, look at the whole chimpanzee genome. We like throw it up on the screen, you know, for all of mm -hmm. us to see. 
and then we also throw up the human genome right next to it. We mm -hmm. compare them. The only differences that are going to exist between them are mutational differences. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be like insertions, deletions, uh, point mutations. It's going to be. Are you uh, talking about? Wait, wait, wait. Are you I, talking I, about the human? You're talking about the human genome there. Yeah, you if you compare about, like the human oh, genome, genome. I'm, I'm saying between like, well, really, yeah, between all genomes, really. Uh, if you compare like the human and, and chimp, for instance, just these two genomes, just the two of them, mm -hmm. the differences between them are going to be like point mutations, insertions, deletions, uh, probably a couple retroviruses, uh, some transpositions, uh, some inversions. But like, that's it. It's all going to be changes to the actual sequences of nucleotides. That's the difference mm -hmm. between us and between us and chimps, between chimps and bonobos, which are the sister group to chimps. It's going to be the difference between us and gorillas, orangutans, blue whales, elephants, pine trees, whatever we're looking at. The difference between the genomes of any two things are going to be the actual sequence of nucleotides. And like, that's it. That's the difference. So the mechanism is I'll talk mutation, the mechanism. Uh, that's I I can't see anywhere where anybody says that that's that's just a proven science there. I mean it is like if you look at if you compare literally any two organisms on the planet, the only difference is like once you get like where do where do our bodies come from? They come from our genome, right? They they are constructions of our genome, and that's it. Like nothing else. I I, I, I understand that. I understand that's okay. that's standard evolutionary theory there. But uh, but I mean, as, far as, as far as as far as observ. Oh, so far as observable science, there, there's there's plenty of people that just like totally would disagree. PhDs in biology would totally disagree with that. I mean, they're welcome to disagree with that. But like, for instance, it like you've probably heard of the Richard Linsky E. coli experiment, for instance, right? Like the this long term experiment with bacteria, uh, the, the Escherichia coli, and it underwent a variety of mutations. Uh, it has to date like not not stopped fitness gains. Like it's still gaining in fitness it has continually accrued more and more and more uh, beneficial mutations. So mutations that arise in an individual and then spread through selection to the rest of the population. Uh, one of the more mm. famous examples, aside from like size increase and uh, I think a reproductive, like they, they increase the rate at which they reproduce is one of them, something like that. Um, one of the more famous ones was a population uh, which was uh, developed the ability to metabolize citrate under aerobic conditions. So in the presence of oxygen, one of the defining characteristics of Escherichia coli is the inability to do that is the inability to metabolize citrate when oxygen is present. That's like definitionally mm -hmm. one of the things that makes E. coli E. coli. And so the argument was made when this occurred that this should be a new species. I think that's irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. Um, the fact of the matter is it gained this ability by a partial gene like or well a couple there was a couple genes that it duplicated it duplicated them and then put them like next to each other so that a duplicate was placed under the control of a promoter which is a region that basically says hey uh hey uh, uh rna polymerase i need to be made into rna so i can become a you know a, a, a protein i can be uh, translated into a protein um whereas that couldn't happen before and so that is a novel characteristic that occurred as a result of a mutational difference, right? And then there's still bacteria, though. Okay, but that was never the issue. We're, well, again, like, we, right. we can come Remember, back to this. But right, evolution is a penalty. Never, yes, you can never leave your ancestry. The bacteria will never, under evolution, it will never, ever, never, ever not be bacteria. Never, ever. That will never not be That's, bacteria. Yeah. If it happens, that will be a gigantic blow to evolution. It might not be a boon to yes. young earth creationism in particular, but it would be a gigantic blow. Because remember, evolution is a pend only. If it starts as a bacteria, it never gets to erase that bacteria entry. It gets to Correct. add new entries at the end, but it can't erase the old entry. A pend only evolution. Yeah. So, so if you ever, if the complaint is ever are... this group, we're still so, this so, group, but, you, you well, have misunderstood really... evolution. Ahead, no, Dan. I'm misunderstanding. I'm misunderstanding what you guys are calling evolution. I don't know that I don't know that I'm misunderstanding so, what is taught in every high school on the planet that uh, that people that everything evolved from a common ancestor. Uh huh. Yes, that is consistent with a pen only. So, yep. 
Okay, are so we, um, are we getting answer, into Stuart... the, are we getting into the, are you a eukaryote questioning? Uh, actually, I was about to, I was actually about to address that. Yeah. So, for okay, instance, that's, <laughs> you, you are, you share a common ancestor with, I'll use Ken Hovind's favorite example, a pine tree. You share a common ancestor with a pine tree because you both have, well, a number of like core eukaryotic genes for like how to deal with your genome and uh, like your cells and stuff. But aside from that, one of your one of the primary characteristics in common we have with pine trees is all of our or most of our cells are nucleated. That's not even technically true, but whatever. We're just going to go with that. Your cells are nucleated. Most of your cells have a nucleus, and that is what holds your nuclear DNA. They also pretty much all have mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, and that is a characteristic you share with all other eukaryotes. So us and pine trees are both eukaryotes. Now we have gone Excellent. down. But that that doesn't that doesn't prove well, a common ancestor. Well, that that I, I have just as easily them. proves like a, well, you're a kind creator. of you're kind of going between different points. You're kind of like switching back and forth between different arguments here. On the one hand, you're, it yeah, seems you're saying, me. yes, real quick, that was Mix's Zoan erasure, and I don't appreciate it. I know, and technically, like your eighty percent blood cell or red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus or a mitochondria at all. So, or no, they do have mitochondria. I think they don't have a nucleus. Whatever. I'm, anyway. I'm just being a dick, um, man. Just don't worry about it. But, which is why I was like, well, you know, it's you have most of your cells have a nucleus. Well, no, like eighty percent of them don't. But whatever. Um, but so it, what's it your cell type? Kind of switching between. Yeah, it seems like you're kind of switching between two arguments here, uh, Daniel, because the argument you gave first was that a, a version of evolution is being taught in which organisms are leaving their ancestry, right? And we said. Mm -hmm. No, no one's learning that. That's not how evolution works. And I know it's not being taught in the high school because I looked at the high school standards recently. Um, so no, that's that's not being taught. Um, we are in a group. We, you are in part of progressively like larger groups, right? It's like a Matryoshka doll. So you have groups within larger groups I, within larger groups within yeah, larger groups. I, I understand how 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 the theory is changing. But where that leads us back to that's not that's uh, been abio, true since a, Linnaeus. A, bi a biogenesis, and you're literally you literally have that's to a have, totally separate um, conversation. So I, I you always say that, but but you literally have to have at some point have these super uh, creations that everything branched off of, and you just uh, sure yeah. where, that's where. At least for the purpose you have to have of alpha, these system. alpha creatures. You have to have alpha sure. creatures that everything branched off of. That has all of the, that has. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I on, don't for, understand for, how you how you don't see that. Would an no, alpha the creature of, the be? That's not how evolution works. Would, just out of curiosity, what, would an, a, a, a theoretical alpha creature be a two-celled organism? I, I would expect one. Sure. Would, so a, let, would let an me alpha creature be a one-celled organism? Is that what an alpha I, I, would be like? I mean, where do, we, where do we go from one cell to, to millions? In uh, a, I in, mean, how, how is... Uh, it, 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 and, then, and then back down again. Because that's what you're saying. We, we started here with nothing. We went up here, and now we're going back down again. Uh, no, right, let I me don't propose, see... Let me, propose, let me propose a stipulation, and I think Jackson will agree to it. Okay. Sure. I will I will stipulate that I am perfectly okay at least for the top at least for this conversation saying that the common ancestor of all modern life was in fact directly miraculously created by the god of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael who exists as the triune god of Christianity with God the Father as the first person of the Trinity, God Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity, I will accept that that is the God described in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, as well as the Apostles' Creed. I will uh, stipulate all of that is true as regards to the creation of the first life on which evolution then acted. So that way we can just say, hey, if you have questions about uh, the origin of life, I do too. If you want to say that that's what God did, I don't want to dispute it with you. I'm happy for you to say that that's what happened. Jackson, would you be okay with that stipulation yeah, for the purposes of this conversation? All right. Daniel, yeah. would you be okay with accepting that that is our 
for this conversation, stipulated acceptable position? Uh, except that I'm not a theistic evolutionist. So, <laughs> okay. So, but would you be willing to say that go? at least we don't have to fight about the first life because Jackson and I are willing to say maybe it was the Christian God who did all of it, and we're not going to object to that as a possibility for at least for the purposes of this discussion. Well, I, okay I still you? don't see how it, it could be okay, but I still don't see how that leads us from one cell creatures, bacteria, all the way up to. I don't know, the super duper T Rex, who then we all all these well, other branches off of. I well, just that's don't. A, Jackson, that's a variety have, of different we have, conversations. Well, do we do have I experiments have to... in which we've? Do we have experiments in which um, researchers have induced multicellularity from unicellular ancestors? We sure do. Mm, maybe more than one. one. There's one with There's one with Matt Heron from 2019. There's another one, uh, or a, a series of them with Will Ratcliffe at all, uh, and like uh, Geos and Bosdag. Uh, in the rack no, what, uh, what, what do you mean by induce them exactly precisely so basically what they do is they have a mutation they develop a mutation or a mm -hmm. series of mutations under a certain set of selective pressures and this causes them instead of when they split from so like they do my or mitosis or binary fission instead of splitting after they do that they stay stuck together so it's not one now it's a two-celled organism or three or four or however many uh, and then they they retain that characteristic indefinitely. It turns out, even in the presence, even when you return them to flasks that have the ancestor in it, the unicellular ancestor, those now uh, multicellular ancestors do not get outcompeted by their unicellular ancestors. Uh, so, who, what experiment was that? Say so, that if you look at down, William, look it up. so William Ratcliffe, R A T C L I F F. Uh, he, he did his work is with uh, if you look up snowflake yeast, which is mm -hmm. a the phenotype for his, his early work with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the your common uh, beer and bread the yeast. The best fungus. It is the best fungus. Uh, so I hear no arguments. So basically, what he did was he took this yeast and he select he he I, I got applied you. it to. I, got you. I can well, look that up. So. Okay, sure. Well, okay. so broadly, basically what happened was he su subjected it to a selection pressure in which being able to settle faster in a flask was better than not being able to do that. And so they mm -hmm. developed uh, multicellularity as a result. And actually, he's continued his work. And not only are they now not just multicellular, because they were even when they were multicellular, they were still microscopic. Like a snowflake yeast is like a few dozen cells. You can't see that. That's too small. Uh, but now mm -hmm. they are thousands and thousands of cells and they're actually like over a millimeter in diameter they form these like actually uh, big uh, clusters they're super cool um i've, I've had they're visible to the naked eye if you look closely yeah they are literally visible um, to the naked I, eye i also want to point out that we know also of instances in which multicellular organisms have created unicellular organisms so for instance um there is a transmissible venereal tumor among canines it's called canine transmissible venereal tumor or some combination of those words and it is in fact a unicellular species of parasitic dog there is a unicellular parasitic dog species that exists it's, oh, or the is it parasite or the hela cells which are parasit whether well, not well they're sometimes they're parasitic but they're yeah. largely independently living human cells there is now another species of human that is an independently living unicellular organism it's also true for Tasmanian devils. There are now unicellular Tasmanian devils that are parasite parasitizing their ancestral population of Tasmanian devils. Basically, we we have going from unicellular to multicellular already observed. We have going from multicellular to unicellular observed. We have uh, bicellular organisms. Diplo uh, I was going to say diplo <laughs> diplodocus, but that's wrong. It's diplococcus. Uh, which Gonium is pectorale. Uh, Gonium pectoralis yeah, are... and algae, they actually span, like, they go from not just, like, two to all the way up to, like, 32 cells, depending. Yeah, so we, we have we have two cell organisms. We have all the stages between that going up into the hundreds of cells. We have organisms which are colonial. We have organisms which are truly multicellular, which means they have different cell types. So, for instance, the most basic cell type differentiation that you get the earliest on is the difference between somatic cells and reproductive cells. So the reproductive cells are involved in making new instances of this species, right? 
Um, and the somatic cells are the ones that actually do the hard work of being an organism, you know, like gathering nutrients, doing most of the uh, metabolism, creating sugars, whatnot. Um, we have organisms with different cell types, but not quite tissues yet, like uh, sea sponges. Sea sponges have differentiated cell types, but they don't have tissues or organs. Uh, we have or organisms with basic tissue types, like we get in uh, some of the more basically derived plants. Uh, we have things with full-on organ systems, like we have with uh, most radial, like, uh, radial animals, like uh, sea jellies and uh, corals and stuff like that. We, we, we have all of this, and we have... I've read of about some of that. that. I've read about some of some transfer, you know, where the, where the cross horizontal transfer and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think that, uh, I, I really don't think it, creationists have issues with any of that. And uh, uh, that's just, but it just doesn't explain. Number one, I'm, I'm young earth. So that's, that's one issue with me. Uh, and uh, it just doesn't explain what we, what we actually see out there. Yeah, yeah. So well, when I mentioned you know, the yeast experiment, the so when I mentioned the yeast experiment, like that was a human time scale experiment in which we know what we uh, they do know precisely what genetic changes occurred uh and we know what the yes. phenotype that resulted was we had a unicellular organism who became multicellular right like i don't i so don't know I, what I, I more understand. we could want from that I have because a because it's it's not turning it's not it's still yeast it Is will it always be yeast forever forever right. until the we're, end of time back, it will be a yeast we're, we're back to a pen only every time you say yeah. it's still x you have misunderstood what evolution is about. Every time you say it, it is a mistake about what evolution is. But also, I have a quick question. It's a it's a mistake of a, it's like a mistake of a definition that's not understood by the general public. Is what it is. You're 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 no, putting like a specific I, scientific I so. evolution is only this when the public understands is evolution is we have all have a common ancestor and we all came down from that common ancestor. We everything that I mean, you those see are equally came true. from that common ancestor. Yeah, those, those are the those same are both thing. True. Those are, those are, they're they're yeah, equally they're true, true, but but you can't we we can't have these. I see these discussions on on uh, X where it's just like big arguments over over uh, definitions, and it's well, just like to me, it's just like what are reasons? we even talking about here? I want I want to keep it simple so people understand what I'm saying. With the example, I don't necessarily I gave, with the example I gave mm -hmm. with the yeast, for instance, if I if I may try. Um, the there is in a sense like a new clade that has appeared right the new clade is mm -hmm. the multicellular yeast right mm -hmm. so there there was a point when there were no multicellular yeast and now there are multicellular yeast right but the ancestors of the multicellular yeast were themselves unicellular right right okay so we have a point where we have a new clade multicellular yeast but multicellular yeast is not separate from they did not lose their unicellular ancestry right mm -hmm. all their ancestors were unicellular so even though their mm -hmm. ancestors are no longer or sorry even though they themselves are no longer unicellular their ancestors still will always have been yeast so the multicellular yeast will still always be yeast even though mm -hmm. it's just a new clade now it is multicellular yeast mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah i, I don't i don't okay. see any so, issues with that okay so so what what i'm saying so when you say for instance there's still yeast we're agreeing because that's a bit like saying well the multicellular yeast didn't come from yeast before right which doesn't make any sense. There's no point at which the multicellular yeast were not yeast or, or that they won't be yeast in the future. They will still always be yeast and they came from yeast. So they themselves are still in this category. Likewise, and I want to take this analogy because it's the same thing, right? It's not even really an analogy. It's just a comparison. Humans, we have characteristics that differentiate us from all other mammals. We can make computers, you know, and, and tools better than pretty much every other species. We are bipedal uh, in our own particular way, unlike any other mammal species on the planet, right? 
we have these characteristics that set us apart, make us unique. But we still have a set of characteristics that make us apes. We will never, those characteristics are part of us, like our particular molar pattern, uh, the shapes of our different bones, our skull. So these, so even though we're humans, we're a small circle, we are part of a bigger circle that is apes. So likewise with the yeast, multicellular yeast is the small circle. Yeast in general is the bigger circle. You follow me? See what I'm saying? It's a huge leap. That's a huge leap. No, no, there's no leap. There's no leap involved. Like, I, leap. It's literally the same. There's a huge it's leap. It's literally the same thing. Yeah. You well, agree that can, multicellular can yeast... Can we ask... You agree that multicellular maybe, yeast... Could we maybe ask what what's the leap that, that Jackson's making? What is, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Because of the, com com the complexity of the organisms. Okay, well, now we have a new term. How do you know what organism is complex, how, how complex it is? Because that's the thing is, creationists love to use terms that do not occur in biology normally, right? At least not as technical terms. And I don't know what they mean by them. And then when I ask them, I very rarely come away feeling like I well, actually I do now understand. I, I didn't give you a scientific definition there. I'm just saying you, you're talking you're talking the creation of a whole boatload of different information that does, that's that not creating well it's not creating apes we're not we're not creating apes it's it's just it and you also have to have a fossil record back to that which you don't have i know you say you do, we do. but that's not what i've seen yeah I mean, that's, you know, huge, huge, uh, big big time evolutionary paleontologists say it's so, we don't so just reading that yesterday. No, yeah, they don't. Dana, that. you, That's ridiculous. 1980. Uh, they're they're on, just man. going, man, this is a big hold mess. On. Nobody has it. Nobody's agreeing on it. Nobody. It's just like we, we don't have Dana, any, anything. Dana, huh. I, I would I would love if, if you could. Maybe, maybe you can't, and that's fine. Maybe you can send it to me later. But I would love to know the name of a evolutionary biologist who is actually a published evolutionary biologist in the actual literature who works on humans, so a paleoanthropologist, who thinks that the fossil record of hominins does not support the ancestry of humans from Miocene apes. If you could name one of those, and not, like I said, you probably can't right now because it's a big ask. There's a lot of names out there. There's a lot of papers. But if you could name one and get back to me, because my understanding from both oh, well. my own reading in paleoanthropology, as well as speaking to paleoanthropologists, is that there is absolutely no discussion about the idea that the fossil record does not conclusively connect humans to other extant apes from a Miocene ape ancestor. That is my understanding Dang, of the I, current I, state of paleoanthropology. Maybe I'm I should have, I should have copied it. I should have copied what I what I read. Geez, just like two or three days ago about that. Look, that's why just, I'm like, uh, look, you can get. That's always the you case. You can get it to me later. Yeah, and also it happens to me it. all the no, time. I, I have to go find it. Yeah. I have to go find it. I don't even know what I was reading. No, that, that's that's very fair. But I will say Roots. this: if you're going to draw from contested bones by San, John Sanford and uh, what's Roop's first name? I don't remember. Christopher. Uh, no, that's it wasn't Christopher. Me, yeah. Okay, because I was going to say, yeah, um, like that. basically, all of the paleoanthropologists that they whose work they cited uh, disagree strongly with the conclusions of their book. So I, I would just point that out. Um, so the thing is, what what we do get is paleoanthropologists who will argue about the exact place of various fossil taxa within the picture of human evolution, right? They'll say, okay, I think that Australopithecus afarensis is not as close to the direct lineage of Homo sapiens as Australopithecus africanus or Australopithecus sediba, right? And we'll say that. And then someone else will come and say, oh, no, I actually think that Australopithecus afarensis is closer to, to Homo sapiens, and that Australopithecus africanus is maybe closer to uh, Australopithecus boisei, right? So they'll argue about the exact shape of this family tree that they're drawing, right? But I've never heard a they, single... They, they argue a whole, about a whole lot more than that. Right. With, with all of the, a lot more stuff than that. Well, so, they do argue about a lot of other stuff, stuff. But I've never heard one. I've never heard one of them argue that the evidence for human evolution from that, or that the identity of humans as apes, or that their evolution from Miocene apes, or that their common ancestry 
with things like they, they, chimpanzees they may and not, they may not they may not argue about and say they're not going to say well this just disproves evolution because they'll lose their funding but they're they argue well, amongst themselves something conspiracy terrible theory. Well, maybe that stuff maybe that's maybe, that's maybe an analogy theory. Might help. maybe right. an analogy might help right well so like, I, it, 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 hold on let me let me finish the analogy right so what it feels like is happening right is if say me and chesh were having a discussion about whether or not pineapple belongs on pizza, right? And I'm going to take the no position, and I'm just going to decide that Chesh is taking the yes position, right? Of course you are. But then someone comes and says, okay, but have you considered that pudding can't lead to pizza no matter how long you cook it? To which I go, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're not entering this conversation. There's nothing to do with this conversation. You're like, I have no recognition of what you're talking about. And that's what this kind of feels like, because paleoanthropologists, like all active fields of science, there are many debates. You will never find an active field of research that does not have debates in it. But pointing out that there are debates in a field of science does not negate the universal consensus on other topics within that science. So for instance, there are debates about how quantum gravity works. You're never going to find someone who says, well, okay, you're never going to find a physicist who's going to tell you that gravity there's just de doesn't there's debates. There's debates on if there's a universal consensus over what you're talking about within the fields and so that's 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 the issue you, you can't not just say evolution. there's not i mean i'm uh, yeah, heck I, mean, yeah. Not I, mean, it's so really like, I mean you can if you look at like any of the surveys that have been done and there have been numerous surveys on this over decades now like the it's not even it's not even brought up like the there are no technical papers that come out that are like se seriously challenging the idea that evolution is like the reigning paradigm in biology it just is. And like it has been for 150 years now. Like no one's challenging that. I have a that's, question that's, for, yeah. for our panelists, um, particularly about semantics, because I think we were getting a little bit into definitions and technical definitions and non-technical definitions and bridging that gap between those things, but specifically about d defining an ape. I'm seeing it a little bit in chat as well of people saying, well, science just defines an ape to be something that is convenient for evolution. Um, could you maybe okay. expound upon that a little bit? Oh, sure. Right. Um, well, so in in one sense, all taxonomic categories are arbitrary, right? This is what I was, what I was saying earlier with the ambulacrarian. Just forget it. It doesn't matter. But uh, all taxonomic categories are arbitrary to an extent. So when we are making up names for categories or like, you know, coming up with like lists of characters for categories, we want to make it as useful as possible, right? Because if something is arbitrary, you might as well make it useful. Otherwise, what's the point of doing it? You're just going to make it harder on yourself. So ape, ape uh, it refers to uh, hominoidia, which is the uh, uh, super family, right? Um, yeah, it's a super family. It's, it's hylobatidae okay, so and hominidae. Yeah, so hominidae, which is orangutans, gorillas, chimps, and humans, and hylobatidae, which is gibbons and siamangs, all those guys. Those two are united together the as lesser hominoid. Apes. Yeah, the lesser apes. Even though I think they're cooler than us, but whatever. Um, Look, so it just means that they're smaller. Ape, That's literally all it means. Yeah. Um, so being an ape is literally just defined by a set of, like, morphological characteristics like having uh nails on the ends of your fingers having a y5 molar pattern uh having like you know your eyes that uh, point forward not having a tail um it, it's just a set of morphological characteristics that define that are that sh we share with chimps gorillas orangutans and gibbons right that's what ape means it refers to that yeah and then if you get a bit I, I broader you go ahead so uh, one thing I want to point out is with the arbitrariness, right? So taxa are labels that humans put on groups of organisms, right? Clades are objectively existing groups of organisms that share common ancestry. And that's true even under young earth creationism, right? Because young earth creationism will accept that, say, a you know, your, your pet dog and a wolf share a common ancestor. And a more recent common ancestor than your pet wolf would share with say, uh, you know, a Japanese tanuki, which is a adorable little canine. Go look it up if you're if you have free time. They're they're great. Um, so like most kind creations like would agree pandas. with that, right? Kind of like yeah, they, kind of like they, pandas and kind trash of. pandas. Well, yeah, they're like the Japanese answer to the raccoon, kind of. Mm. 
Uh, They're even called raccoon dogs in some cases. Um, So anyway, even under Young Earth Creations, at least most versions I've ever heard of, clades exist. Scientists would like their taxa to map to clades where possible. But exactly where we put a label is fundamentally going to be arbitrary. So for instance, if the history of cladistics had come out differently, and we didn't use the word ape to refer to all of hominoidea, but only the great apes, well, okay, that's a difference of how we use the word. But the clades themselves either do or don't exist, right? So if all hylobatids and uh, hominids share a common ancestor, then that's a clade. Whether you call it ape or you call it dinglehop, it doesn't actually matter to the science and to the objective reality of what's going on. So yeah, is ape an arbitrary category? Yes. Are the clades involved arbitrary? No, they either objectively exist or they don't. And the question of science, which is ultimately the question of this debate, is do they actually exist? I would say yes. Jackson would say yes. I believe, Daniel, you would reject common ancestry for all apes, including humans, right? Pretty much. But I have to uh, take yeah. a quick break here, guys. Excuse me. Oh, okay. Hey, we could take an intermission. Um, I'm not having fun. I don't know. Chess, you're muted. Chess, you're we muted. can take a we can take a quick intermission, but we've only got about ten minutes left. <laughs> oh, oh, that's true. Well, I mean, okay. I'm I'm okay with going a little extra if, if people want to. Mm, are you guys are gonna do this to me? I'm no, it's your show, I'm Chesh. okay with do whatever it. you. Want. People are okay with. Yeah, you you can shut it down at any point. So you have I think the complete power. I think. Well, I, think I take also the was. Sorry, go ahead. I was also gonna. I was going to go, but I was just going to wait because I also figured it would only be two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what might be a good idea is while he's gone, chill your shit. And then when we go, we can let him yeah. chill his shit and we can actually get out of here on time. Jackson, what are you, what are you okay. doing tomorrow? What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, uh, you know, I'll probably go to work, do my normal work okay. stuff. What are, you, what are you doing after uh, that? Like around 8 p.m.? Uh, 8.01 p.m. I guess there's... Mm. There's some guy, there's some some theropod. You see, I'll be mm, hanging out with right. him for a little bit. Um, we're, we're talking about the silly guy who like shares a name in common with me. So you know, mm-hmm. mm. is it like maybe called Jackson yeah. with Jackson on the Dapper Dinosaur channel? What? That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dapper, that's your channel. Yeah, so. It'll be on your channel. channel. Oh my yeah, god! So hey, head over to my channel and you can one. see Jackson with Jackson on the 26th. Oh, and Daniel's back. Links are in the description down below. Please continue. We are getting close to wrapping up as well. So if we do want to schedule another one of these and and continue on with the discussion and go kind of further down this rabbit hole, as we're starting to get into things like abiogenesis and things like very, very niche, like planktons. I'm more than happy. Mm -hmm. We'll give Daniel some time to look up some of the stuff that he wanted to bring to the table as well. We can definitely look to do that. But finish your couple of points and we're going to start wrapping up. Um, well, what, what for what you were saying right before yeah. I left, um, that you know you can sit there, you can create a um, it's a theory. You could create a theory. We'll just call it a theory, even though I don't really believe evolution is a theory anymore. But you can create it and put all of these names on the call. This is a clad. This is a clad, and we absolutely have a common ancestor. That has to be proven. I mean, I know that's what you believe it is, and I know you believe it's proven. But there's a whole lot of people who don't believe that. And we have reasons for it. And we don't just, we're not just looking at the Bible for those reasons. We're looking at, we're looking at science and going, you know, there's, it, there's something that's, that's not, it's not going to fit that. And that science is that for an animal, for, for, uh, and I'm just going to, we'll just say with the same cloud, okay, for a chimp mm-hmm. or an ape or a common ancestor of either of chimps and apes and people. That's just, that's just not it's not, it's not evolutionarily possible. First off, you don't have the time for it, if if time was even a factor in the matter, which I don't believe it is. But you also don't have the the genetic, the the uh, the what would be because you're you're what you're literally having is a is a is a growth of genetic of ge- of genetic information. Because see what you're talking about, you're you're saying, well, it's handed down, and then there's mutations, and that, but that's is a lot more complex than that, a whole lot more complex. And you guys I mean, there? Sort of. 
Kind of not really. I mean, it kind of depends on what you mean. Like there are other forces involved, like there's, you know, natural selection, sexual selection. So yeah, it's not just mutations happen and new organisms. It's like those variations occur in populations, natural or sexual selection acts on them, and genetic drift and gene flow. And these, well, I, uh, you know, cause those variations to change in their frequencies th throughout generations. And then that can ultimately result in a new species. I mean, we've directly observed with emphasis on the concise part. I am not convinced that either of you could answer something concisely, so... You know what, Chesh? I can't disagree with you. <laughs> You're welcome to try. But Daniel, do you, do you have questions you could direct it at either of us or both of us? Like, what do you want to know? Because we, we asked you so many questions, and I feel like it's a little unfair. Uh, no, I, I would just... I would like to see the genetic mechanism where you're going to be able to, where you're going to have an, a common ancestor of apes and humans and chimpanzees and how that's going to work. Cause I don't see that, that that's just not, that's just not out there as literature. Uh, there's, there's, there's a, a little bit here and there. Uh, like I was reading about um, a horizontal gene transfer from a certain type of plants that vert that a parasite, infected another plant with and created ferns with. But I don't see any kind of literature like that with human beings. Yeah, I call that bogus. Yeah, I don't think question, that's... I, well, hold on. I, Maybe I, I can I, phrase that into a question. So could, could the question be, what is the genetic mechanism that allows organisms to differentiate and have different morphologies going forward drastically Is that the drastically yeah drastically change okay. not not just not just uh, not just uh environmental changes like uh, my beak is a little bit bigger and blah blah I, blah well i would have a twofold answer to that one is that all of the drastic change is ultimately an accumulation of what you're calling environmental change right so mm -hmm. with a combination of also there's drift which is actually very very important to evolution which is the the changes that occur not because of selection or environmental pressures, but just because mating has random aspects to it. So exactly which genes get passed on and which alleles get passed on is, has random aspects. So accepting that, because that's, I don't think I've ever seen anyone disagree with the idea that there's non-deterministic parts of mating and, uh, you know, inheritance, but that, yeah, first of all, the drastic differences in morphology are a combination of just lots and lots and lots of these environmental changes, which I'll, I'll, I'll accept that terminology. And then two, um, I mean, it's, it's mutation is the origin for this diversity that is then acted on by selection and drift. And that those are the mechanisms that are put forth by evolutionary biologists. Now, I'm not asking you to accept them right now. That's not what I'm asking. I'm just saying the answer to the question, as would be given to you by evolutionary biologists or people who are well versed in that field would be that it's an accumulation over time of mutations that accumulate as a result of drift and selection, whether it be natural selection, sexual selection, or artificial selection. And like I said, I'm not expecting you to accept that, but that is the answer that I, evolutionary biology has for you. Jackson, can you answer the question like, more concisely than Dapper did? What was the, that was pretty concise. Question. I do not remember what it was. Yeah. That was pretty concise. <laughs> I mean, I think I think his answer was, I mean, it sounded fine to me. I, I really wanted to give uh, you, Daniel, I wanted to give you uh, homework uh, instead of uh oh! Instead of like, you can tell to, you can tell Jackson's like, been working at, at a school for too long. I, I want to give you homework, Daniel. Um, and this is <laughs> quite simply, I want you to look at. I want you to take two organisms for which there exists genetic data on both that you accept as sharing a common ancestor, and then compare that with two organisms you don't except as sharing common ancestry, like for instance, humans and chimps. If you could look at like the genetics of humans and chimps and read about what actual genetic differences separate us, and I want you to pick out what specific genetic events occurred, you know, in our line that would have been impossible that y you think, right? Like what do you think could occur between two organisms you accept as related but not between two organisms you don't accept as related. Does that make sense? 
I can, I can um, probably phrase it. I can probably phrase it easier. Um, oh, I understand, I understand what this means. Oh, okay. That sounds like an awful, awful big I homework barely, assignment there. I barely understand yeah, what it means. That sounds <laughs> like an awful big homework assignment there. Well, because uh, that's ultimately, that's what because I, the heart because of the I could, issue, right? Yeah. Well, I could accept that a, a dingo is uh, of the same, perhaps is the same genetic, uh, but that would have to be looked at through his genetic front. But can a dingo mate with a, a typical uh, a German Shepherd? Probably not. Yes. No, it absolutely can. Dingo German can. Yeah, they're, they're just both yeah. dogs. Yeah. yeah. Just both, uh, Dingoes uh, are yeah. specifically domesticated dogs. They're feral in that they now are, are living wild. But when you look at the genetics, they are domesticated dogs. They're much more close to anyway, a German to get... than they are a wolf. Yeah, I'm just so I'm not can, trying to get back into an argument. They can Oh, absolutely. Yes, or yes, a, wild yes, dog, a, a wild dog in a, a wild dog in Africa. Can those mate with domestic dogs? No. No. Like the Cayon Pictus, which is the African painted dog or wild dog, cannot mate with uh, Canis genuses, or at least I am unaware of any reported instances of a hybrid Lacayon Canis organism. Um, if you find one, that'll be interesting. For instance, there was recently a Pampas fox that mated with a can genus Canis to make a, a Pampas fox slash Canis. But then again, the Pampas fox is much more closely related to dogs, like domesticated dogs and wolves, than it is to, than either of them are, to the painted dog of Africa. So that was actually not super well, unexpected. It was previously unreported, but, you know. Well, those, that, was, those, that just, would be my basic basic answer there. But but when you're when you're talking about drastic differences, like between uh, uh, anything that changes that drastic, where it's like, that's not even a dog, you know what I'm saying? Uh, well, again, that's never a thing that evolution will accept. Okay, no, but, no, well, no, 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 but humans yeah. and chimps do not have drastic differences between us, right? Like, it's all relative changes. Everything, every difference between us and chimps is just a relative yeah, change. Yeah, I think we might need to know what a drastic change Can you give us an example of what yeah. a drastic change is? You would have to, yeah, you have to think, define I, what a drastic change is, but. Yeah. I like, think your that's brain, a, okay. we have, like, uh, the difference between our skull and a chimp skull is literally just, like, our brain is bigger, our skull, like, is, is ballooned more, uh, and our face is less uh, prognathic. Like, that's, those are the primary differences between our skull and that of chimps. Like, I don't think that's a big difference, or that's a drastic difference. That's there's nothing new there. There are no bones that we have that chimps don't or organs we have that chimps don't or vice versa. We have all the same organs and bones. And so... Baculum okay, erasure. Like, okay, except for the... Okay, but the thing with the baculum is, like, they also have a highly reduced Concise. baculum. Concise! So we've just... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the point is... The point of my question is simply is to try to figure out, like, quantifiable, like, genetics that... could A genetic change that could not have happened from our common ancestor. So some kind of change that we, that you know, from our common ancestor that couldn't have happened, right? Can, can, let me ask you this. Can they look at the genetics of a chimp and a man and trace it back? Yes. To say a common ancestor. Yes, they, they can. absolutely can. Yeah, I mean, we, we it's share, actually fairly uh, like, we share 90, like 90, very doubtful, very doubtful of that. Very so, doubtful. I mean, that's okay. So just that, to wrap fine. it up, so just to wrap it up here, I've got one last question right. from the chat for Daniel. Um, and I'm going to need, I, it's a two part question. So just a yes or no on the first part, and then maybe an extrapolation for the second part, just for the sake of brevity. Um, is there a logical contradiction between the existence of God and evolution being true? You think? Uh, it's a little off topic. I know. Uh, yeah, that's like, that's not a yes or no question. Cause there's a lot of different well, there's factors a... in that. Well, that's the extrapolation yeah. part. Do you personally believe that there's a logical contradiction? Uh, if you're looking straight at the science, I would say, well, just, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I think I there's no answer. No, I can't answer that. Yeah, no problem. It, maybe there, that can be a, a, a question too many, for another day. Too, yeah, too many variables in that to be able to just answer that as yes or no. Well, yeah, it's a matter I'm, of personal belief, right? It's like, do you believe it? Yes yeah. or no? It, w if so, why or why not? The why or why not definitely gets into the, like the nitty gritty of. Oh, I, I definitely, answer. I definitely believe there's there. It's not true. Okay, so. So you so believe that, that there's a logical that, contradiction? Sure. Yeah, I'd have to, but we'd have to go, like go through. Yeah, that's a whole. Of information. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think there's I'll we've that, opened up a couple. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Deborah. I was gonna say, for, for my part, I'll say that I think that there are 
numerous God concepts that do not logically contradict the idea of evolutionary, like evolution, broadly speaking, biological evolution. Um, I do think that there are some that do. And so I think one of the problems is that when you say, does the idea of God contradict X? One of the problems Either is that there's specific. not just one concept. That, yeah, there's there are multiple God concepts that have been proposed. And there are also more or less an infinite number of God concepts that have not been proposed, but that could be. And is are all of them incompatible with evolution? I can't see how that would possibly be the case. No, is no. your particular God concept that you happen to believe in as a theist incompatible? That's a different question. And I do think the answer there could very well be, uh, yes, they are incompatible. For instance, I, I don't know exactly what Daniel's God con uh, concept is. I do think that it probably corresponds broadly to what I was talking about earlier with a Trinitarian God, but maybe his his does contradict. And I don't, I wouldn't deign to speak for him, but like, yeah, it, it could be that yeah. your personal God concept contradicts. Also, questions for another day, because I think we've opened a handful of um, different topics, uh, like Young Earth Creationism, for example, and like the length of time um, for the Earth's existence or events in the Bible, etc., as well as we opened up abiogenesis. I think the only thing we didn't really open up a can of worms here was Flat Earth. Um, let's not. Let's just let's leave that one off pinned to the side for maybe like why, next year and a half. Or we could. <laughs> well, I, only, I, don't know. I mean, my only my only reply to that is why are you wasting your life? Is all I can say to the flat earthers. Why are you wasting your life? <laughs> The one thing I mean, everybody agrees on. The one thing that everybody agrees on. I'm here yeah. for so, it. <laughs> here's Less. the thing, though. I, I just just uh, Saturday, I, I coined the term wrong earther. And it is oh. a term that encompasses both young earthers and flat earthers. Because the thing is, thinking that the earth is 750,000 times younger than all of the oh evidence my God. points to isn't really more ridiculous than thinking that the earth has a shape that's different than what all of the actual measurements of the and earth and if i do and not cut of dapper off here he is gonna go off on these cans of worms for eternity thank you everybody for joining us perhaps daniel will be kind enough to grace us with his presence again perhaps with these two perhaps with other people we'll see what's going on thank you so much like and subscribe there's so much shit going on go check out everybody's links down in the description below thank you all three of you for joining me today this has been wonderful i very much enjoyed the conversation i hope you did too out there who's been watching thank you so much for joining us i hope you enjoyed the conversation too and we are gonna get out of here thank you everybody have a good night say goodbye everybody bye guys bye.